Oh god, am I getting in trouble for this prompt? The terrible Spy Kids 3D. I'm sure as a kid, we all loved the Spy Kids movies. Something about them just perfectly encapsulated the bonkers fantastical elements of our young brain's imaginations, and to go back and stamp on such a beloved nostalgic legacy is nothing short of treasonous. But here I am, doing just that. And while I guess I could have gone right from the very beginning, I didn't really want to. Those original, original films are something that my rose-tinted glasses just don't want to jeopardize yet. But the 3D film? Now that's an interesting case, as not only is it the one film I missed back in the day for some reason, but it's also much more notably less well received. And to add on to it further, it's all about the futuristic tech of basically today with virtual reality and chuffed full of all sorts of video game references. So what better a movie to look back at to judge our modern day? Let's look at how the future looked back in 2003. Oh yeah, and this was around the time when 3D was all the rage. Ah! Yeah, okay, I can tell. So we start off at the sassiest amusement park I've ever seen and heard before, judging by the music at least, and we're given an over-the-top narration from main character Juni. Now, you probably know who this guy is. He's the little brother in the whole Spy Kids series. But what I like most about him is his actual IRL name. It's Daryl Sabara. Daryl! Spelt correctly and everything! Do you know how rare it is to see my own actual name on the screen? Anyway, Junie is now retired from the old spy agency OSS and is now a detective PI gumshoe type of guy, doing random things all trying to save up to play this new game, Game Over, the biggest VR game in history. But after breaking his piggy bank and losing his earnings, cause of course he does, he settles with going home instead. And soon enough, Junie is given a visit from helicopter hair girl Gertie Giggles. You know, Hannah Montana's friend. There's gonna be a list of celebrities you've seen before. She's here to convince Junie to rejoin the OSS and to tell him that family's important and everyone's your family. One swift rejection later and we immediately have a discussion with the President of the United States, although it's actually the old head of the OSS. Also, it's freaking George Clooney, and I love the censor bar joke on him. Still, he finally convinces Junie over as he reveals the news that his older sister Carmen has gone missing on a mission. Oh shiitake mushrooms. I'm gonna be real annoyed if YouTube shoots me down for saying that. It's at this point that Junie is actually chucked into the game. The mission's all about Game Over being a trap and a device for the creator, the toy maker, to enslave the minds of the youth and escape. And Carmen is MIA inside it. But I gotta give it props here. We're at the 10 minute mark now, and we're in the game. That's some incredibly fast pacing. And sure, I guess you could argue it's rushed, but considering every other film in existence drags these kind of prologues out, it's honestly refreshing to have a film just jump into what we're all here for. That being said... <laughs> The visuals just look awful. This is seriously rough. So after landing in Lazy Town apparently, we're then introduced to more eye candy with pogo toad enemies. Also, there's collectible coins for no real reason because it's a video game. And when they attack this one random guy here, it just, oh, there's, there's no depth, there's no tiling, it, it's just God awful. Oh, and after knockoff Twilight guy over here, here's another one, the the nerdy guy apparently, who just claws Junie into a hole. W what a wild start. Oh, he fell. Thanks for telling us, dudes. I couldn't tell. So Junie loses one of his nine lives, because everyone's a cat in this world, I guess, and it's revealed that he has four hours to save his sister, not the 12 as he previously thought when he was being briefed. Why? Uh, well, because... Time flies when you're playing games. Hmm, sounds like bad writing to me, Chief. So next, Junie uses the robot guy's metallic goo to climb himself out of the hole. Oh, and from here, we've made it to the iconic world of Windows XP. Huh. So those same boys are here again, though now with a new third guy. I'm Rez. Of course you are, buddy. And after learning that cheating causes an immediate game over, Juni is shot to the moon by the boys. Ugh, what are those physics? Now with the writers backed up into a wall, Juni gets some random assistance from OSS, an additional lifeline, granting Juni one person to come in from the outside. How this logically lines up? I have no idea. Is this teleportation? Do the OSS secretly have the entire family caged up ready to get into the game? Whatever. Either way, Juni picks Grandpa because his energy levels were 
double back up to his arms and brains because of his legs or something. And apparently, uh, sure, here he is. And to make things more, uh, distasteful, I guess, a random power-up then appears. Mega Legs! I mean, I know it's 2003, but that's a little on the nose. Though the actor was actually paralyzed, so maybe it's like an actual fantasy for them. Also, the power-up is more than just legs, it's an entire super suit. This is some Iron Man green screening work from now on. They're really predicting the future. Oh, and then Grandpa just disappears anyway for following a butterfly out in the middle of space. <sighs> And hey, if you like my stuff so far, then do consider subscribing. Remember, only you can help balance out my unsub ratio count. I don't know what I'm doing. The toy maker, meanwhile, Sylvester Stallone, is watching him. And he's got Carmen trapped in an energy bubble field. Moving on, Junie now makes it to Rebel Rockets. He's lucky something was here at all, really. And it leads him to a stadium mecha battle arena. Conceptually, this is probably pretty cool, but... My oh my are the visuals just ugly. And Junie's thrust into battle immediately. It doesn't even feel like anyone's actually here. So here's the mecha. No head, it's just a single platform to stand on and no logical sense of gravity taken into account. And his rival is a girl. And of course her mecha is built like a grown woman. Now Alita Battle Angel over here is the quiet, competent tomboy type and she just wrecks him in battle. Though, how Junie doesn't fall off the platform when it's literally, like, sideways, we'll never know. Hi. I'm Demetria. Oh, uh, nice Demetria too. Now this battle just gets wild. The most accurate part is the polygonal AI audience members that you see in video games. These mechs just start flying each other around. Juni literally doesn't seem to understand the concept of centrifugal force one way, but then proceeds to sprint around the diameter of the stadium the other way. And like, every time Juni is hurt, he loses a single life, whilst Demetra here is literally hit once and proceeds to just lose multiple. This game is rigged. And like, I get what they were going for with this battle, all physics aside, but even the logic of how Juni wins is a bit of a stretch. Cycling around an enemy is a common trick in games against like an eyeball or a robot, but Demetra here isn't spinning on the spot to turn the mech around to follow him, so she shouldn't really logically get dizzy from just this. It's just really unpolished all around. And with that done, Juni sprung away back to Earth, just as easy as that. Here's the toy maker again, and what's his kooky gimmick? Well, his trio of assistants are actual holograms of himself in different archetypes, and he's debating what he should be doing, or something. That part doesn't really work. Back to Junie, and he somehow didn't lose a life from the spring jump earlier. And look who it is again! The entire planet of Earth has a population of three apparently, and it's these guys. So now because he stood in front of the poster one time, they think that he might be the guy. A prophetic character who's said to guide them all to winning the game. And there's only one way to prove that, by beating them all in a race. Huh? This is essentially just fan service, really, and like, I, I guess it's that's fine, but this was created by professionals, you know? I I'd be proud if this was made by me, but it's not the same. There's no kind of build-up or standing logic for any of this. So it's time to race. Claim your vehicle of wacky races cars. There are no rules in this race except win. Okay then. Also, there's a couple extra randos in the race added in for flavor, I guess. This next joke though, I do like. One, two, three, go. It, it's a nice subversion. So the race naturally has more bonkers illogical action in it. There's the purple unicyclist who uses an electric stun weapon and is taken out by a pie attack that just comes with the car rather than an item box or something. Rez convinces Junie to press a button that ejects him, sabotaging his chances, though why would you cheat when you're investigating if he's the guy? Also, he then crashes, losing three lives from the wreckage. Grandpa Deus Ex Machina's in from the back, putting Junie on track and just plucking the nerdy one away. And as they continue to beat up Junie down the path, more carnage happens to everyone until they all fall down a pit. And Grandpa's just there, always knowing what to do, apparently. Run another bike, Junie! And it's the final stretch, with a new vehicle from the purple rival, and it ends with Junie doing a handstand on the handlebar, his vehicle being swiped from underneath him, landing on a wheel piece, 
and sliding into first place. I mean, this just goes down a massive rabbit hole as it goes along. It's funny, there are moments where this looks genuinely cool and logical, like when they're all steaming down the tunnels, if only the music was a little bit better, but these bonkers theatrics just really take me out of it. I, I guess that's the style though, it's all fan service and no thought. Oh my god, the purple rival was Demetra all along. And with victory confirmed, Juni is now officially the guy. <laughs> I love how there's all these random extras appearing celebrating too. They don't appear again, they're just there to exist to be happy, I guess. Good for them. So Grandpa arrives to give advice as Junior's now worried about his new guy status. Whilst Grandpa says this is good and that he wants to get to the toy maker, ignoring OSS's rules. Uh, uh, I guess that's a... Uh... A conflict of morals and... Meanwhile, the kids band together to combine their skills. With my strength. My brains. My cool. My intuition. And my axe. Oh boy, everyone knows you can't succeed without cool and the skills of a woman. 2003 really was a different time. Next trial to overcome though is the programmers. According to the OSS, they're doing so well that the programmers are now onto them. What? Pull them out of there now. Pull them out of there now. What? And you can tell the programmers are nearby because they leave green chips in the air. I didn't know that's how they worked. Well, whatever the reason, someone's been cheating and Demetra then reveals a shortcut map. And then come in the programmers, leathery, scary, and cool. Or so I presume 2003 would argue. And as Junie pointlessly tries to just push the programmer's arms away and call for Grandpa, here he comes in a random invisibility cloak, apparently. Let's see what you really look like. <laughs> Suck it, you computer nerds. You look so nerdy and weird. You all look the same with glasses and a desk. Hey! There's multiple things I could say about this scene, but this whole movie is just chucked full of these kind of moments. So let's just watch Grandpa awkwardly laugh for the next few seconds. <laughs> so the Toy Master has another scene, and again, it's terrible. I mean, the sciencey one is looking at the camera rather than the hologram, the original looks unconvincingly annoyed, and the joke of the scene doesn't fly either, with him being annoyed of the others talking amongst themselves without him. Or something. So next, a health pack appears randomly, and Junie gives it to Demetra, cause of course he does. And the guys all smirk and nod, like that one scene in Civil War. Which feels really creepy when they're like 12. So with the forced romance scene ticked off the box, it's now time for the forced backstory scene, with Junie randomly asking why Arnold is in the game. I didn't even realise his name was Arnold. Everyone steps back like they're in some kind of play for dramatic effect, even though Demetra clearly wouldn't know what his backstory actually was, and Arnold then tells us that he wants to win money for his poverty-struck family. But plot twist, the game now demands that they fight each other. Survival of the fittest. Wow, they really chucked that in last minute to build up the scene, huh? I guess kids just wouldn't have the memory to have remembered that tragic backstory if it was told any sooner, right? Nor would they care about anyone else's motivations either, because like, uh, what's freaking Rez's backstory? He was born cool? So Arnold puts up a seriously good fight and Juni should have lost all of his lives, but the game is still rigged in his favour, and he's saved by another deus ex machina, Demetra taking his place and sacrificing herself. Game over. What a waste of all those extra lives. You never even got an email address. Ha, <laughs> what a relatable tragedy. So Grandpa randomly shows up, as he does, saying not to fall in love with the game, even though Junie fell in love with a person, but uh, okay, and they move on. The toy maker now plans to put Carmen back into the game as he thinks it's his next best move. The other hymns disagree, and that's all there is to the scene. So here she is, big entrance and all. The gang's all back together, 50 minutes into the film. And she reveals that the toy maker is the one who put Grandpa in the wheelchair, warning of his true intentions. And after conflicting with the group briefly, Carmen eventually leads them to the lava level, where regardless of lives, it's game over if you touch it. That's some convenient writing, so they go somewhere else. All the while, the toy maker is rummaging through ideas to lead them into the right direction, since Grandpa taking revenge on him will set him free. So he plagues the other route with Tinker Toys, which is apparently way worse than lava because... They said so? D sure. So diving into lava, they all magically grab makeshift surfboards out of rocks along the way and lava board down the mountain. Logic is just thrown to the wind at this point, but I, I guess it's been gone for like an hour. 
But hey, I'm getting mad Sonic Adventure vibes. That's great. Rip that wave, Junie. Does the grandpa even realize what he's saying, or the actor for that matter? Back to the OSS, and they're concerned that the kids are being led to the toy maker and learn of his connection to grandpa. So to stop his return, they elect to drown them all in lava to give them all game overs. But why haven't they been helping out more if they can manipulate the game like this? There was just one lifeline up to this point? I mean, come on. And so everyone is wiped out, but no game overs. It turns out the lava is safe. How convenient for the writing. Man, those water physics suck. But hey, it's more 3D bait, and I guess that's what this film's really about. So now they're at the door to level five, and Grandpa is magically missing. This writing really sort of hot wherever it wants, doesn't it? Carmen reveals to the rest of them the toy maker's plans to enslave their minds, though we never really see that in the entire film. And the boys now distrust Juni, thinking he's the mystical deceiver in the game, which again only just got established. You gotta create conflict where you can, I guess. So who's the guy? Stop saying you're the guy. We all know that you're not the guy. I am. What? Elijah Wood? But you clearly don't look like the poster, and you're just another deus ex machina to add to the list. And isn't this like right around the time of Lord of the Rings? Uh, what's with your proportions? You're looking down on the others whilst they're looking up to you. Is your life just played with weird oversized and undersized people? Anyway, this guy shows up and bands the group together and bursts through the impenetrable door. Cake. It's all cake? Huh, I guess I never thought of it that way. Outdated memes. And just like that, our convenient guy just comes and goes. Oops. Man, this game really is rigged. Still, one shock was apparently all the room had, as now it's no longer an issue. And Demetra makes a reappearance. I'm his girlfriend. Who are you? Man, relationships moved quick in 2003. Was this agreed on, really? Anyway, plot twist, Demetra isn't real. She's been the deceiver all along. And the toy maker starts his plans to keep them all here forever by having giant monkey robots take them out, I guess? Or like, like there's no real enslavement other than uh, intimidate. Uh. Oh, and now grandpa's just here. Always the lifesaver, pointing them to the exit that was apparently here the whole time, and being the one to totally hit the kill switch. Demetra cries, runs to hold the exit open, because apparently she actually cares, sacrifices herself, and they finally get to say their goodbyes. Though the boys, again, don't really get like a monetary reward for being in the game, but alright, okay. <sighs> and following their escape, Grandpa hesitates to leave, talking about how functional he is in the virtual world, which is a really interesting theme for the movie, but not much of it comes to be as he agrees to leave anyway. What a, what a, what a missed opportunity. But the film's not over yet. Potentially, the toy maker's out on the loose. After all, Grandpa was the one to hit the switch, and he's not to be trusted. Also, here's those three boys now in real life. That sure was some quick teleportation. And the nerdy guy looks better IRL, apart from wearing unfitting clothes. And then that's, then that's the last we see of them. It, it was literally just a reality check, I guess, to, to stick it to the gamers in the world. No big victory for their arcs, Arnold's still in poverty, I guess. Sure, alright, what an ending. Grandpa then admits that he freed the toy maker, claiming he must be defeated to stop the game truly. And the consequence of that is that the toy maker has invaded the real world with those giant robots again, and only being visible with those VR glasses. He's upgraded from virtual reality to augmented reality now. We're in the world of Pokemon Go, like 13 years beforehand. I mean, this whole bit is a pretty cool concept, I must admit. Even 17 years later, we don't quite have that level of AR vision just yet. When are they gonna make those Apple glasses? With the situation so dire, it's time to call in the family. Finally, after an hour and 15 minutes, the family comes into the family theme series. And the dad apparently always comes with a constant flow of wind, but it's not enough. Call in everyone. Damn, this is crazy. You thought Avengers Infinity War had the boldest cinematic crossover. I can't even imagine how rewarding this would have felt to kids who had seen the entire franchise up to this point. This is probably actually one of the most exciting endings that could have been propped up for this film. This actually foreshadows a lot of great things in even today's films. But man, all these call-ins sure know how to teleport to the scene. 
And after not really seeing them all fight, there's one giantest one left, and you have to shut it down manually from the inside, because the writing demands it. And it's Grandpa's turn. He rockets in, and he talks, explaining how the toy maker's mistakes made him lose his legs, how it took away so many things from him. I missed my daughter's birth. And wedding. Uh, is that really connected to the leg thing? He then turns around to say that he gained humility and understanding from it, and all this time, he's wanted to tell the toy maker that he forgives him. A massive relief for the toy maker, Sebastian. And with that, he decides to just stop. Guilt was the thing leading him down this deep, dark path anyway. It's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. Of course that's the message. And it ends with a big old family call. Hey, only like half the cast are actually in that final shot, it lied to me! And oh, I hate when that name pops up. But ending the credits off on the very original auditions of the two children actors is a really nice wrap up to the whole thing. Ending wise, this is probably as successful as the film could have been. And at the last minute, it finally felt like kind of a family movie with an emotive ending. But man, there's a lot that this film dropped the ball with. <sighs> And it's a shame, because this movie had so much potential. No, really, as much as I've got this labelled as a terrible movie, the intentions behind it aren't nearly as shallow, and a lot of what it tries to do is honestly really, really cool. Its biggest flaw is how dated the ugly visuals are, making the whole thing just look terrible in every frame, but underneath that, with a whole bunch of writing tweaks, this is a seriously revolutionary film about to be sprouted here. If it wanted to, the whole film's message could have been about the dangers of virtual reality and the issues of being addicted to a fake life, or diverge more into the potential of bioethics like we had briefly with Grandpa. It could have been about how, as a disabled old man, he has little potential in life left, and this world grants him functions reality can't give him. But to a youthful kid like Junie, he has infinite potential in the real world, and he shouldn't be wasting it stuck in a world like this. It's the pros and cons of literally falling in love with the game, as he warned earlier on. This one scene alone just feels like it's several layers higher in weight than the rest of the movie. And also, as a franchise that is all about family, this film sure does kind of abandon the family for most of the screen time. At the end of the day, it's just a fan service movie showing different gaming references and gags without any real world building or fleshing out, and it really just comes off as stale. It's a big feat to make a film almost entirely on green screen, trust me, I know I've gone through that for like 130 hours, but as much as it did predate the ending of Endgame or the concept of Ready Player One, it just falls flat as a symbolically and logically good story for just how thought out it isn't. So the director Rodriguez clearly got it right later on as he actually directed Alita Battle Angel. Huh. Yeah, I guess I can see that. And as much as I say this film wasn't as successful as the other two, it still somewhat succeeded, quintupling its budget of $38 million to $197 million. Sylvester Stallone, meanwhile, earned a Raspberry Award for the worst supporting actor for his performance, an unfortunate mix of bad writing and bad acting, it seems. But beyond that, this film is awesome. I'm sure as a kid, I would have loved it. But if it was just all a bit more smarter, this could have been a great futuristic film that was on point too. Instead, looking back in 2020, it's fantastically terrible. Ah well, there's always the newer Machete films to watch if I get another Spy Kids itch again. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. <sighs> I can't believe I never knew the guy's name was Daryl Sabara. I mean, uh, it's so it's such a mini victory to see my own name spelt correctly on the big screen and so large. Like I usually wait and scan through credits to see the word Daryl when I'm watching like Marvel film credits to wait for the end or something. But yeah, who'd have thought you would have ended up with Megan Trainer? The things you learn.